Chose us to be his holy and blameless people. 
He chose us to be his adopted children, all according to the purpose of his will, and all directed to the praise of his glorious grace. God chose us to be in spiritual union with Christ so that we could experience the redemption and the forgiveness of sins that he had to offer and so that we could be restored to the full capacity with which God created us to image him. He chose us in Christ to lavish us with his grace. <coughs> And all of that was according to God's purpose, which he publicly exhibited. That is, which he publicly put on display in Christ as a plan to unite everything in heaven and everything on earth together in him. He predestined Christians to obtain an inheritance from him through his son. So that all who hope in Christ might exist for the praise of God's glory. He predetermined that Christians would be sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit so that His glory would be praised. So right away, Paul, in this letter to the Ephesians, is giving us this breathtaking vision of who God is and what God has purposed. In short, God's purpose, which he had before time began, is his own glory. That's why we see all of those scattered references in Ephesians chapter 1 to the praise of his glorious grace, to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory again. All of what God accomplished and brought about in Christ is directed towards God's own glory. Now, if we heard a human being talk like that, it would sound like they were being extremely egotistical and self-centered. Working for my own glory. But that's not the same thing with God. The reason is this. God is the highest good. God is the purest and greatest form of love. God is complete and utter holiness. And so whenever he, whenever he is acting for his glory, he is actually acting in such a way as to display the greatest good, the greatest love, and the greatest holiness. Human beings can't make that claim. That's why it is egotistical and it is self-centered for us to work for our own glory. We can't display those qualities like that. <laughs> and when God displays his goodness and his loveliness and his holiness... Everything that witnesses that glory is benefited and prospered. And so, looking through Ephesians chapter 1, we see that God's glory is revealed when He blesses people in verse 3. When He loves people, verse 4. When He adopts children into His family, verse 5. When He redeems and forgives sinners, verse 7. When He lavishes people with grace, verse 8. When He reveals His wisdom and insight, verse 8. When He gives to us an inheritance, verse 11. And when He seals His people with the Holy Spirit in Christ, verses 13 through 14. So God is majestically good and lovely and holy. Holy. He's not self-centered. He's not egotistical. And whenever he reveals that majestic goodness and holiness and loveliness, his glory is revealed and our good is secure. So God's eternal plan is to reveal his glory through the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And as such, it's a plan that encompasses a personal aspect a corporate aspect, and a cosmic or a universal aspect, all of which we see right there in the opening chapter of Ephesians. We see the personal aspect of the plan in terms of the individual salvation given to every person chosen or elect in Christ to be adopted sons and daughters of God. But at the same time, that individual salvation given to those new sons and new daughters naturally forms them into a collection of people united together in their unity with Christ. And down in verses 22 and 23, that united body is referred to as the church. There's the corporate part of God's plan. 
And yet there's a cosmic, a universal part of the plan made very clear in verses 9 through 10, which describes the plan set forth in Christ as a plan to unite all things in heaven and on earth in Him. So when we take all of that together, it points to the enormous scope of God's purpose in creation. As well as to the massive implications that that purpose holds for His people, the church. So now I want us to fast forward to chapter 3. Because in chapter 3, all of these themes converge once again, and for the final time in this letter. Paul says, starting in verse 7 of chapter 3, Of this gospel I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of His power. To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. To preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to bring to life for everyone... What is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Now two things are involved here in the ministry that Paul says that he's received by grace from God. First of all, he received the grace to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to a Gentile audience, that is, to a non-Jewish audience, to a people who historically have not been associated in covenant with God. The second grace that was given to Paul was the opportunity to bring to light or to illuminate the minds of everybody about how God has chosen to work out that mystery. How God has chosen to work out His eternal purpose. And the reason that, Paul, that, that, that God gives Paul this grace of, of preaching and illuminating was that so that through the preaching and through the illuminating, God's manifold or God's many-sided wisdom could be made known through the church, the collective body of sons and daughters that He's called out of the world in His Son. Now notice very carefully, what role Paul assigns to the church in this place. Paul says that God intended to use the church as his platform from which to testify to his richly diverse wisdom. So God is essentially using the church as the stage upon which his infinite wisdom plays out for everybody to see. Now, instantly, that presents us with a very striking reality about who you and I are as the family of God, the church. We are the body through whom God's wisdom is supposed to be made known. And a crucial function of our role in the eternal purpose of God is to show forth and to show off God's glorious wisdom. Mm -hmm. Friends, does that not add incredible weight to what we do when we come together as a body and in what we do when we leave this assembly, does that not add incredible significance to who and what we are as a church? Does that not add so much more depth to what we do as a people when we get together as God's family, the church? Isn't it incredible that God intends for you and for me to be His testimony to how ingenious He is. Let that sink into your minds for a moment. God is using us to showcase and to broadcast His wisdom. That's what you're supposed to be doing right now. That is your function. When you leave this place, you are a showcase for the wisdom of God. Now that instantly raises two questions that we need to answer. Number one, to whom is this many splendored wisdom of God being showcased to? And secondly, how is that many splendored wisdom made known through us? through the church? Well, Paul answers the first question right there in the text. 
Paul says that God's many splendid, splendor, multifaceted wisdom was being made known to the rulers and to the authorities in the heavenly places. Now, is that what you were expecting? Was that the answer? Was that who you expected God's wisdom to be shown to? I don't think that's what we were expecting at all, was it, church? That God's wisdom is being shown to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. That's an odd thing to say. It's particularly odd to us because in our Western world, on this side of the Age of Enlightenment, you and I are accustomed to dealing more in the concrete. We're accustomed to dealing more in the substantial, more in the empirical, the things that we can see and touch and taste and experience with the five senses. Our logic go sometimes goes like this. If it can't be analyzed, then it must not be a problem. Or if it can't be analyzed, it may not even be real. There are rational explanations for everything. In our world, science and technology has essentially done away with what one social science philosopher by the name of Charles Taylor has described as the enchantment of the universe. The universe has effectively been disenchanted by the progress that we've made. So, you and I don't naturally root cause human problems, human turmoil, chaos and confusion to spiritual causes. And we certainly don't make that part of our regular conversation. Talking about higher powers, more spiritual powers that may in fact be at work behind some of the situations ongoing in our world. But that was not the world in which Paul and the earliest readers of the New Testament lived. You see, Paul came from a rich Jewish heritage that understood that certain powers and authorities existed in the spiritual realm. And some of those powers and authorities weren't necessarily friendly to God or God's purposes. And more than that, these powers and authorities had the ability to exercise great influence in our world, in the physical world, the world that we inhabit every day. Now, according to Paul in another place, specifically the first chapter of Colossians, Jesus made all the powers. Jesus made everything that exists, including the powers that Paul was talking about in Ephesians. But at some point, based upon the storyline of Scripture, at some point these powers changed their allegiance and they began opposing everything that God stood for. In fact, the very first inclination in our Bibles that something like this had happened was in the opening scenes of the book of Genesis where we see Satan tempting Eve in the garden in the guise of a serpent. Satan is a power a ruler in the heavenly places that exerts great influence for evil within God's physical creation. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, Paul even refers to Satan as the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience. You can read that in Ephesians 2 too. But as we keep on going through the biblical narrative, we see mention of demons about whom God warned not to make any sacrifices to. Back in Leviticus chapter 17 and Deuteronomy 32, the writer of Psalm 106 makes a similar reference about demons to whom you better not make sacrifices to. That's Psalm 106 verse 37. And then we get into the prophetic literature, which can get downright strange. The prophet Daniel has a vision of this great heavenly being. And this great heavenly being tells Daniel about another creature who goes by the name of Michael. And Michael is one of the chief princes who is going to help the heavenly being do battle against other princes associated with the nations of Persia and Greece. Now interestingly, the Greek translation of the Old Testament uses the same word for chief as Paul does for rulers in Ephesians. And that's interesting because Paul read primarily from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And just about every instance where he cites the Old Testament and the New, he's quoting from the Greek translation, not the Hebrew. So that leads us to the conclusion that as far back as Genesis, certain rulers, certain powers existed. And as far back as Daniel, some of those powers and rulers were even associated with certain nations. So that's the heritage that informs the background of what Paul is, is, is explaining in Ephesians. Only now, these spiritual powers 
which have historically been opposed to God, are being put on notice that God has achieved final and decisive victory over all of them. Now, God is using the church, you people, me, as a testimony to His wise plan to unite and gather all things in heaven and on earth under the dominion of Christ. And that includes the rulers. That includes the authorities and the heavenly places. God is using the church to say that cosmic reconciliation is coming and it starts with the church. He's testifying to the powers that if you want to know what's coming, look at this group of people that I've got down here. Now that takes us to the second question. How is this many splendid wisdom of God made known through us, the church? Well, for that answer, we have to pay very careful attention to the focus and the flow of Paul's thought through Ephesians up to this point. You remember that he's already revealed the scope of God's plan to bring himself glory by uniting everything in Christ, whether it be in heaven or on earth. And as he gets into chapter 2, he identifies that the starting point of this unification is the church. He goes on to describe how that Christ has united the two great divisions that existed in the first century. The divide between the Jew and the non-Jew. Jesus has taken those two groups by his death and resurrection and he's made one new man out of them. And that's why Paul can say as we get into chapter 3 around verse 6 that this mystery which has been hidden for all ages is actually that the Gentiles, non-Jews, are destined to be incorporated into this one body under the one head of Jesus Christ. So it's actually by virtue of the very existence of the church. By virtue of this new and multi-ethnic and incredibly diverse body united under one head that testifies to the spiritual powers that God has wisely healed and restored the breaches and the brokenness and the disorder that has existed for so long and to which those powers and authorities have been contributing all these ages. It displays God's wisdom in the way that God has brought about the victory. It displays God's wisdom in the manner of that victory. He did what it is Paul said he had done through the power of his son, who seemingly was defeated on the cross when he was tortured, humiliated, and nailed, naked, bloody, and broken to a cross. That looked like defeat. But in fact, that was where Jesus achieved his greatest victory. And it was that victory that sealed the fate of the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. That's exactly what Paul says in chapter 3, verse 11. This was according to the purpose. This was according to plan. God meant to do this. This was according to the eternal purpose that he's realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the mere existence of the church, the fact of the existence of the body of Christ is testimony to the spiritual powers in the unseen world that's surrounding us even right now that God is indescribably wise. The church's existence declares that God's wisdom is diverse, it is intricate, it's varied because of all the ambiguities and confusion and perplexity and chaos of human life, Embedded within, embedded within all of the ambiguity and the perplexity and the hardships of human nations, out of all of that, God has brought one united body together, centered around and cemented in His Son, Jesus Christ. So Christian, this means that you are part of something so much bigger than what you've ever imagined. You are part of an ongoing testimony that God is making to the spiritual world. God is using you as a testimony. 
God is using you, Christian, as a showcase for his wisdom. He's using you to sound the defeat of the spiritual powers that have been aligned against him. He's also using you, by the way, to, to showcase his glory to the other spiritual powers that are on his side. Christian, you are a character in an otherworldly drama. And if you're in Christ and in his church, then you're an instrument in God's hands to show off his greatness and to show off the glory of his wisdom. And it's just that realization that takes us and Paul to the second text, which was read this morning. After unpacking all of this about God's plan individually, corporately, cosmically, about how God displays his wisdom through the existence of the church, Paul goes, goes on to offer a prayer for the strength of every Christian who could read and understand their role in God's eternal purpose. And then he worships. Look at verse 20 of chapter 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. The idea of where the church fits into God's plan, of how God intends to use the church, and the means by which God binds the church together in Christ led Paul straight into praise. And that's exactly where it should lead us. After this realization of God's plan and God's purpose for us, his church, we should be led to ascribe him glory just as he receives glory through his son. And according to Paul, this glory that he receives from us, from the fact that we exist in Christ, is a glory that will last forever. He's going to always receive glory from you. Because look at what he says. It's a glory that he receives from the church and through Christ throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. It is an unending glory. And you are the conduits of that. That word glory is an important word. So now I've not defined it for you, but it's important that we understand what it means. In the New Testament, that word glory mostly means honor, splendor, and radiance. But in the Greek Old Testament, that same word translated a Hebrew term that referred to weightiness, to heaviness. And weightiness and heaviness carried with it the idea of something important. If something was heavy or weighty, it usually meant it was costly. It usually meant it was valuable and therefore very significant. So the history of the terms related to God's glory points to God's weightiness, God's significance, his splendor, his radiance. And being the good Jew that Paul was, he knew that all too well. Paul writes, therefore, that the church is going to be the source of of God's glory forever and ever. The church is going to be the place where God's heaviness, where God's significance, where his importance is made known. So that God is important. That God is significant. That God is weighty. It's supposed to be evident among us. <laughs> so how much should that then reorient what we think about and what we say about and what we do as the church. We are part of something enormous and wonderful and beautiful and honorable. We are central to God's plan to showcase His wisdom and glory. But we're only central because Christ is central. And Christ has invited us into His life so that we experience life with God. So our duty in the here and now, Christians, is to be the showcase for God. God has created us in Christ Jesus to be his primary testimony to the spiritual powers in the unseen world that he is wise and that he is holy. New Testament scholar Christopher W. Morgan describes it like this. He says, because of Christ's saving work and through our union with him, we as the church are now the image of God. We're the one new people, the new humanity. The people called to display God to the world. The new creation in the image of God. Called to reflect Christ and embody God's holiness. So friends, we are God's display people. 
We are the people that God puts out in the storefront of heaven's window to advertise his wisdom and glory. We are the stage for God's waitingness for his plan. And that's why he's used, I mean, Ephesians chapter 4 starts like this. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Paul has just unpacked this huge vision of what the church is and how the church is supposed to function. So now his exhortation to Christians is walk like you're worth it. Walk like you're worth this big vision of God and God's purpose. <coughs> and what does that look like? Well, he takes the rest of the book to show you. If you keep going in chapter 4, it looks like church unity. We walk worthy of God's eternal purpose by being united together in Christ. That means that we do away with all of the shallow, the petty, and the narrow and small-minded things that typically rip Christians apart. Because you're a part of something that's so, that's so much more, that's so much bigger than the way that the windows are decorated, or the way that the hallway looks, or the way that the fellowship hall is cleaned up. You're a part of something enormously bigger than that. So be united. <clears throat> he also says that we walk worthy of the calling by walking in holiness instead of in Gentile ways, instead of in greed, impurity, ignorance, and lust. That displays God's holiness to the watching powers and rulers. It means walking in the same love with which Christ loved us. And that means walking with a disposition that's always bent towards sacrifice and forgiveness. It means walking in truth and righteousness. Actively trying to see God's will in everything as opposed to walking in darkness and wickedness and leaving God out of your decision making. It means walking in wisdom, figuring out how to best use the time that you've been given for God's purpose because you now live in the midst of a sin-stained culture. Christian, you are part of something enormous in scope, universal in sweep, and glorious in purpose. What you do as a Christian and as a member of Christ's church has ramifications in a world that we can't see. You are God's testimony to the spiritual powers, especially those aligned against God. That means that when we do church, we're doing and we're being so much more than what we can see in our small slice of reality. There's another world swirling around us. And what we do in our world matters in that world. Because God has chosen us to be his showcase for his wisdom and his glory. So if you're not part of that church today, then by default, you're siding with the spiritual powers that work against us. <coughs> and yet God has sent his son to bear your sins in his death, to secure your eternity through his resurrection, to remove your guilt and make you part of that spiritual body so that you can begin serving as a testimony to God's glory and wisdom. <coughs> So if you want to be a part of that body, if you want to be a part of that sacred testimony today, make Jesus the Lord of your heart, turn away from your sin, be immersed in the night, take that chance right now as we stand together and sing this next song. Soon and very soon we are going to sing.